Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to Fallen London. Today we are going to be having a look at November's exceptional story, The Committee. As always, for the first episode of a new story, I remind people that uh, you can buy this experience for yourself, you can support Failweather and make it brilliant by becoming an exceptional friend. It does loads of things, you can look it up, but either way, you want to <laughs> play this, feel free, go ahead. And without further ado, let's get started. Some urchins have lifted a plucked chicken from the shopping of a stooped veteran and are passing it between them, keeping it concealed. The man seems likely to die soon, either of malnutrition or explosive rage. We can either retrieve the chicken, one must look after London's senior citizens, we can take our turn hiding the chicken, it's good practice for future encounters with the constables, or we can steal from the urchins. Let's retrieve the chicken. You swoop down upon the scene and seize the chicken from inside one of the urchins' platoons. The group jeers at you for spoiling their game and disappears down an alley. You return the chicken to the veteran. It smells none too fresh. Thank you very much indeed, he huffs. If I'd had those tiny blighters in my regiment, they would have turned out differently. You escort him home and he insists you stay for a glass of wine. Rather a good glass of wine, as it happens. So, after unlocking the story, we seem to have received a scented letter. An intriguing envelope awaits you at your lodgings. It takes you a few sniffs to isolate the constituent fragrances. Those spicy, pungent notes could be camphor, and there is a defined hint of old books. What could have caused the odd brown stain on the flap? Let's open it, who doesn't enjoy a little mystery over breakfast? Lady, I have become aware of your activities through certain ex-colleagues who speak in the highest terms of your skills and tenuous nature. I should be most obliged if you would call on me at your earliest convenience. The letter has a shaky signature and you do not recognise, and gives only a partial address. Your best guess is that it is somewhere in the vicinity of Lady Bones Road. Something shell-like and discoloured slides from the envelope and lands on your toast. Is it a... a fingernail? It looks like we are going to be going to Lady Bones Road. One word from the street name narrows your search to a small estate behind the Brass Embassy. But it is Melvin Street. Melvin Crescent? Melvin Court? The house number is misshapen, but carefully misshapen, deliberately obscured. How should you approach this? Well, there's two options here. We can think like a detective. You're used to tackling enigmas. Can you reuse those skills here? Or we can ask the local domestic staff. You'll need a few coins to overcome their reticence. Let's think like a detective. You narrow down the possible addresses using every subtle factor at your disposal. The postmark, the quality of the stationery, the precise lexical construction of a particular fungal tang you attribute to someone dropping the letter in a garden en route to the postbox. Your reasoning leads you to a small bungalow set behind ivy-choked walls at the end of a cul-de-sac. The butler admits you without question. My, you're good. The butler shows you up a gloomy bedroom where a bandage-wrapped figure in pyjamas is hunched against the bedstead. His eyes flick open as you enter. May I present the chairman, the butler says and withdraws. The chairman of what? It seems a fair question. The bandages around his jaw shift. A smile. Or a problem with the masculatory muscles? Since you managed to locate me here, I conclude that you know something of the obtuse workings of government. I was the chairman of the Committee of Consultation on Residential Affairs. Let me save you some time in the library. You won't find any record of our work. I expunged the archive myself. Well, how is his health, although the answer seems pretty clear? The chairman sniffs, or at least something moves in a cavity below his eyes and above his mouth. Kind of you to inquire. Primarily, I miss my pipe, but you know the bandages and I do tend to fall asleep while smoking. No, since you ask, I'm not in good health. In fact, I should be dead already. This is why I have requested your presence. 
comes up. How can we help him, judging by his neighborhood? This could be lucrative. I do not know if you have been presented for the death of an older person. Something, a curious process called the emergence takes place, during which a moth leaves the chest cavity and embarks on a new journey. He scratches his ribs. My moth seems to have, I suppose you might call it, stage fright. It will not emerge. He looks out the window. I consulted Dr. Slomo. It is his professional opinion that my problem is psychopathological. There is something holding me to this carcass, something not yet done. His eyes slide to you. My lady, I am quite sure I know what it is. The chairman rubs his temple. Ochre-coloured flakes squeeze from between the bandages. Okay, well, let's ask some questions. What did this committee do? There is a long pause before the chairman speaks. You would take him for a sleep, were his eyes not open, measuring you. Finally, he speaks. We made a decision. It was not a responsibility I welcomed, but we were public servants and that was our job. Afterwards, I was pensioned off. We all were. Never had to work again. They just didn't want us around the office in case we talked. Lucky, really. If we had been working for the opposition, they would have put bullets in the back of our heads, just to keep us quiet. What has he left undone? He's unlikely to get out of that bed and do it himself. Secrecy was central to our work. It became my essence. We are the ones who know never talk. For half a lifetime, I have defined myself as a keeper of secrets, and now I find I am unwilling to let one truth die with me. With a grunt of pain, he shifts his head. The proof exists. We preserved one document from the entire affair, and divided it. I am the only one who knows where my colleagues are, and they hold the pieces. If you would help me track these other members down and reassemble the document, then you will understand. The chairman's voice has become wary. So where should we look? Not that you are interested in a top secret government document suppressed for decades, you understand? Another weary smile. Each of the committee members had their own quirks, and age has not mellowed them. You will need your resources. Our cryptographer still works in a library around the corner in Lady Bones Road. Don't expect straight talk from him. The cracks woman naturally gravitated to Spire. You'll need a stealthy approach for her. Our Carmelian still operates in Vale Garden. To their delight, I, can, I can't accurately describe her. Or him. And the last, well... He handed the rough stuff. She's in a cottage in Watchmaker's Hill. Watch yourself there. The chairman's eyes drift close. A soft cough from the door reveals the butler, ready to usher you out. Well, since we are already here in Lady Bones Road, let's go amidst the stacks. Convival Cryptographer is somewhere in the volumistuous public library on Lady Bones Road. So we can either ask the staff, although librarians are a prickly bunch, or we can just try rooms at a random. It is a big library, but serious library users do, on the whole, remain in one place. You should find him eventually. Wow. Located. You glance into a few rooms, observing browsers, shelvers, scholars, cal catalogers, and one young couple on the third floor doing something which surely appears in an entirely different section of the subject index. Five minutes later, you find the cryptographer ransacking a catalogue of index cards. The staff will thank you for distracting him before he can effect any more alterations. Wow, that's a face. <laughs> He bumbles with a stack of unrelated monographs, cross-referencing so energetically that you doubt that he can actually be absorbing the text. He glances at you as if considering whether to incorporate you into the footnotes. Well, let's ask about his background. Why was he recruited for the committee? The cryptographer pushes his glasses back upon his nose and gives a childlike smile. I like numbers, you see, and puzzles, and shapes and word patterns. 
They invited me to join the topographical and statistical department, and I was very happy there. Not many of us. Interesting work. He draws a little closer. I'm still working, of course, but hush, hush. He shows you a page from a tatty military history book. He has filled it in the entire Black Sea with what seem to be random letters printed in blue black ink. Let's find out what his role is. Why did the committee require a cryptographer? His smiles falters a little as you press him about the committee. I think they, they thought I would be good at shaping a message, which I am, of course, but not in the way they wanted, he gazes out the window. Everybody was very concerned that our communications remained secret for the entire week, and of course, I'm good at that too, but I don't know that I was very helpful in making decisions. The cryptographer looks down at the mess of books on the table. The others didn't like me, he says. Well, let's ask about the document. All this background is fine, but it's time for specifics. The document? He frowns, waves a forehead, nodding between his eyes. Yes, there was a document. He looks around the room. You follow his greys across thousands of books. I wonder where I'll put it. There is an awkward silence. He breaks it by clicking his fingers. They knew I would forget, so they made me hide it. There was a rather rough lady on the committee, a cold fish, you know. It's in the barrel of her emergency knife. Can you bring me that? You must be talking about the Tormentor. Oh. So, we need to go to Watchmaker's Hill. She opens the cottage door. A visitor, so deep in the swamp, do come in. I'll make tea. Her eyes are ice. As she turns her back at the sink, you examine the meticulously ordered room and its simple contents. We can drink our tea. It can't be election season again already, she says as she places the steaming cup before you. What is it this time? The census? You sip the hot tea. It has notes of vanilla and lemon, and a strange Carganian tang. You glance at the tormentor. He's making a point of not looking at you. Your vision swims and the saucer trembles in your hand. You spit your mouthful into the saucer and dash the cup to the floor. The tormentor springs to her feet and lunges for the door. You tear in pursuit, trying to clear your head. The ground lurches beneath you like a ship at sea. You catch up with her in a remote spot shadowed by giant mushrooms. A blade gleams in her hand. Oh, well, that's the knife we're looking for. You have followed an expert in violence to a secluded place. Yes, not the finest moment. Her knife comes at your ribs. Luckily, I fear our dangerous quality allows us to uh, fight this woman. Instinct kicks in and you knock the blade sideways with your forearm, jabbing stiff fingers towards her eyes. She steps back, which gives you precious seconds to draw your own weapon. Now it's a fair fight. The tormentor reaches down to her boot and pulls a second knife from a hidden sheath. It seems she prefers to have the advantage. The tormentor jabs with one knife and blocks with the other. So there's a few options here. We can press the attack. She is used to being in the one in control. How will she react when her victim seizes the initiative? We can distract her. There are more dangerous things in the swamp than a knife-wielding torturers. Well, sort of. We can trick her. She's lured you here for a reason. You could pretend to escape. Or we can disarm her. Two knives give her more options than you'd like. Let's disarm her. This is the perfect time to deploy that joint lock you've been practicing. You're getting close, feign and go for her offhand wrist. A step and a twist and her knife goes spinning through the air, splashing into the murky swamp water. She looks after it, and then back at you. Why is she grinning? With a flick of the wrist, she produces another knife from her sleeve. How many does she have? Brilliant. <laughs> I asked uh, well, part of me wants to try that again. Ah, we failed. <laughs> this is the perfect time to deploy that joint lock you've been practicing. You're getting close, fang, get grabbed, and get grabbed by the elbow. She plants her feet and thrusts, sending you wailing back, the mud tugging at your feet. You barely have time to recover your balance before she's on you again. At this rate, you're going to end up face down in the marsh water. Right, let's not try that again. Um, 
distract her. When the cry of a marsh wolf echoes somewhere close, you look past the tormentor and gasp. A simple ruse wouldn't fool a five-year-old, perhaps, but the tormentor lives in Watchmaker's Hill and knows its many dangers. Without thinking, she looks, and then you're on her, striking three times before she shoves you off. She shakes her head, angry to be caught out. Let's try tricking her. You strike at her side, circling around so that you can reach firmer ground. Then you turn and dart behind a mushroom stalks, as if fleeing the scene. She comes after you. Implaceable and out of sight, you sink down and brace. When she rounds the stalk, you strike at her knee. She rolls back, grimacing. Cunning, she says. There is blood between her teeth. The frustrated, the tormentor lunges at you and overextends. That's enough. Time to take her down. You pull her towards you and strike at her undefended spine. She cries out and goes down on one knee, then topples into the marsh. The knives drop from her hands. Rats scurry away as she falls. I take it you were one of my old customers, she rasps. Can't say I remember you. You remind her of her work with the committee. Ah, she says, like a gourmet who has found a bug in their salad. I knew I'd hear about that again. The dispassionate tormentor lies in the swamp water, her breathing heavy and ragged. Let's ask about the decision. Did the committee do the right thing? I don't even know what they've done. She wipes blood from her mouth with her sleeve. What? There was no correct decision available. They just wanted to devolve responsibility for an impossible choice. I didn't care what we decided. I did my part and took the pension. I've been working for myself since. I'll be back at it again in a day or two. You're asking me for answers? You'd have to ask my old bosses. She coughs something into the dark water. Let's ask why she was selected. It seems unusual to change career from torture to civic decision making. They already had people who could understand the plight of the common Londoner. Contempt drips from her words. They needed someone who could put emotion aside and cut through what was important. Would there be rioting in the streets, or would they fall in line like sheep? Those wintry eyes lock on you again. When the civilized veneer is stripped away, slice by slice, that's when you get to people's true character. It's a fascinating process. So we can decide what we want to do with her. We can give her, get her medical assistance. It's probably more mercy than she showed to her victims. Or we can leave her to die slowly. After a quick search for the document, of course. Uh, I'm not the kind of man to leave somebody. She started the fight. I didn't want to kill her. So let's get her medical assistance. Her hands lie slack as you go through her pockets looking for the document. All you find is her final knife in a sheath tailored into her coat. It seems wise to remove it. On a path nearby you spot a hunter with a bandaged eye, an arm stump, and directs his efforts to the tormentor. You find the document in a cottage beneath the lining of a drawer. One line reads, decide how and when this information should be presented. You are going to need more context to understand it. So let's go back to Lady Bones Road. I think we have the knife. Ah, the cryptographer seems to have moved to another room. We will have to locate him again. Wonderful. Let's just, yes, you have some idea of what a cryptographer finds interesting, perhaps a little treasure hunt is in order. You go back to where you met him before and leave an enigmatic note encoded with a simple cipher. You place four more on the stairs, in the catalogue under a marble bust of a startled anthropologist and on the back of a lavatory door. Then you go downstairs and wait. Fourteen minutes later, the cryptographer shows up clutching all five notes. He brightens as he sees you. Oh, hello! Isn't this a fantastic library? He aligns the papers on the desk without looking at them. I need the, um, he says. The keys 
in her blade. The tormentor, hidden in the pommel. Pommel. He clicks his fingers. Just the word I was looking for. He scribbles in a notebook. Hopefully, the right one. She was a woman of multiple knives. He holds the knife at arm's length. Ah, yes, I remember. He bangs the pommel repeatedly against the desk, drawing disapproval from a room full of browsers. Then he unscrews the hilt and a small, curled piece of paper drops out. You see three strange numbers on it. The cartographer nods to himself and breezes from the room. You follow the cryptographer upstairs. When he selects a grim-looking volume of outdated lore from 1877, tucked inside is a hand-stitched chapbook. He gives it to you. Here you are. A bit of help. This doesn't look like a piece of the document. The cryptographer has lost interest in you and is circling the room, reading over the shoulders of nearby library users. At the end of his circuit, he wanders out the door. Hmm, so we have two options. We can read the chapbook, or we can ignore the chapbook. The title reads Infernal Records at St. Guthalax. Guthlax. Let's read it. This is dynamite stuff. It details a cache of information held by the church about the activities of devils. A comprehensive library whose very existence is denied by the bishops. The building of St. Guthlax has been boarded up for years. But on page 7, a carefully drawn map shows tunnel access from a nearby paper warehouse. You read every single page from the chapbook. Fascinating. But the cryptographer is long gone. Oh god, we have to find him again. We can read the signs. You have a strong sense of how the cryptographer operates by now. Can you follow his trail? Here, an atlas that has been left underneath the political theory section. Here, words have been extracted from different textbooks on Neathy geography to form a statement about optics. And here, a page has been overwritten in two separate colours. You borrow tracing paper, rip it in half, soak one half in blue ink and the other in red, look through them, and follow the resulting message to the natural history section. The cryptographer looks up at your approach. Hello, he says. What a coincidence. I hear they're opening up a new section on mollusks. He says, rubbing his hands together. Marvellous. Ask about the document again. That chapbook was not his piece of the document. I, um, I've been struggling with a problem. He rubs his forehead with his palm. I left a keyword in the safest place I could imagine. My thinking was that if she can break into anywhere, the cracks woman. So the safest place would be with her. I scratched the keyword under the jewel on her brooch. Oh boy. You need to obtain the Crackswoman's brooch. Now where was the, was the Crackswoman? Was she in spite? Yes. Aha. The capricious Crackswoman. The chairman's directions take you to a crumbling penthouse atop a rookery. The residents of the lower floors eye you with suspicion. You had better move fast to confront the Crackswoman. So we have two options. We can either impersonate a salesperson. Everybody enjoys opening the door to shout at an unwelcome caller, don't they? Or we can enter from above. The residence has a skylight. You can see a route to reach it. Let's go from above. You creep up on the penthouse roof, stepping on the frame to minimize noise. As you draw close to the skylight, Probing the corners of the gloomy room beneath you, the capricious Crackswoman comes into view at the table. She is tinkering with disassembled locks. With one smooth moment movement, you swing into the room and land in a crouch. Although startled, the occupant recovers immediately and is out the kitchen window before you can straighten up. You vault after her. A rooftop pursuit. You pursue the Crackswoman across the slippery rooftops of spite. You leap to a new roof just as she leaves it. He glances back. He knows the terrain better, but is obviously not used to such dogged pursuit. We can trust our instincts. Confidence is everything during a frantic pursuit punctuated by deadly drops. We can make steady progress. You don't need to catch her immediately. You just need to tire her out and not fall to your doom. I think we should trust our instincts. You dash across the ridge and slide down the mossy slates, springing at the last moment to a neighbouring roof. There is just enough grip on the gamble edge to ascend quickly to the apex, where you seize the 
For now, to swing yourself around in one fluid movement. Plummeting towards the drop, you use your momentum to leap to a lower terrace. You roll with the impact and come out at speed. The Crackswoman stares at your acrobatics for a few seconds, mesmerized. You charge past a begrimed blonde urchin. Shoo! She says. You pursue the Crackswoman across the slippery rooftops of spite. You are a few feet behind her now, almost close enough to grab her shoulder. So we can make a patriotic maneuver. A lonely flagpole installed in prouder days extends halfway across a five-story drop. It has a little spring left that could be a shortcut. We are totally doing that. It requires assertiveness and grace. You take two extra steps onto the pole, crouch as it dips, and launch yourself into the void. The pole, in response to your confidence, lends you the extra velocity to soar comfortably onto the next roof. You grip with your toes and scan for the Crackswoman. He's running across a flat ridge. Closer now. You pursue the Crackswoman across the slippery rooftops of spite. You lunge. A loose slate betrays you, and your fingertips brush her jacket as you slip. We need to make a tricky ascent. The Crackswoman seems temporarily stranded atop a small spire. This is your chance. You grasp the mouldings, feeling your way more by touch than sight. Once you get your rhythm, the ascent is tough but steady, and the Crackswoman stares you down as you climb towards her. At the last moment, she turns and vaults to a lower stack, hanging by one hand for a desperate moment before she finds another grip. She spots a flat section of the roof and charges off. You make the same vault, and you, too, lose precious seconds securing your grip. You've fallen behind again, but now it feels like you have the psychological edge. And this seems like the... Well, I haven't a choice. I'm out of actions, but it seems like the perfect place to end the episode. Not really. More of a... More of a cliffhanger. But either way, we shall carry on our pursuit of the Crackswoman in the next episode. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, subscribe, let me know what you think. Your comments are greatly appreciated. And as always, I'll see you next time.